Well, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, it's it's uh, five thirty Friday morning, and um, I hope you're planning on having a great day today. <clears throat> if you've uh, stayed with me here on this journey through the book of James, there have been some interesting things that James has tried to clear up, and I think he tries that for us. <clears throat> Maybe uh, none more important than the fact that James is writing to the scattered believers who were persecuted and, and, and now in many cases have been dying for their faith. Um, that's how the book of James starts out. Um, they were unsure about their future, much like we are, and pretty unhappy about their circumstances also, which are to sound familiar to a whole lot of us. Um, if you happen to join me here this morning, you please put uh, something in the comment section there. I'd be glad to see who's with me this early. Um, so right off the bat, uh, James says that you can um, get get through this with joy in your heart. Good morning, Christy. Nice to see you on there this morning. He says that you can get through this. And that's what he was telling the people who were persecuted and losing their life. I mean, they were afraid they were going to die. And, and he says the same thing to us, that we can get through this thing and we can get through it with joy in our heart. In verse two of James one, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. When things get tough and things get hard, you can still have the joy of the Lord in your heart. And then he begins to show them what that looks like and how to get there. Um, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely to all men without finding fault. Um, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. I mean, there has come has to come that time where we really trust God, where we're just going to believe God and believe what He says, and we're gonna we're gonna ask according to uh, His word. And He says He'll do something about it. the wisdom that God is wanting to give you more of begins with accepting His word as truth, the Bible, the whole thing. It's all true, and and when we accept that as a fact and understand. And, and, then, and then receive the promises of God, knowing that God wants to give us good things. God really does have a good plan for our life. He has good things for us to, to, to receive from him. God gives good things. If you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And then he comes and he says in verse 22 of chapter 1, uh, he follows this up by saying that we should be doers of the word and not hearers only. Good morning, Creedy. Not hearers only. Because if you're a, a hearer only and you're not doing the word that you've heard, he said, you're deceiving yourself. If you believe the word that you have heard, then do what the word ha has, has said to do. Do the word that you've heard. Believe God, knowing that every good gift and every perfect gift uh, comes down from the father of lights. Uh, and then on in chapter two, he said, if you want to know the wisdom of God and do faith, um, you can't be prejudiced. You, you can't be partial to some and reject others based on whatever status difference there is, whether it be financial or social. Hi, Roy. I hadn't got to see you in a while. Hope all is well. Um, um, in fact, God often chooses the ones that most people reject. Like he says it in James chapter 2, he says, um, um, hath, hath God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Um, don't We can't have this with partiality. We can't have the faith of God with partiality. And he doesn't want us to be deceived about this either. He said, if, and, and he goes on to say in that chapter, if you stumble in one area of the law, he says, you're basically guilty of the whole thing. And so what he's trying to say is, is, you know, if you're, you're good, you know, Sunday Christian, good doer, all these things, but, but you still have partiality. He says, you're, you're still guilty of the whole thing. You, you can't be good in some areas and then overlook the areas that you're not right in. <clears throat> so his point uh, the same um, all the way through the book of James. He has the same point all the way through um, the book of James. And here's how you can have faith that works. 
That's what he's wanting to do um, in the book of James. He wants you to have a faith that will work even when nothing else seems to be working. Uh, even when everything else seems to be falling apart, you can have a faith that works. Uh, and then chapter three, he said, you can't be blessing God and cursing men at the same time. There's just, that just doesn't fit. My brother and these things ought not be so. It is a sign of the same type of deception. Um, and and he, he goes on to say and talk about how it, it's caused by envy and strife that we can clean up what we say and we can represent God in all the things that we say, but we, we have to get rid of that envy and that strife. And then in four, in chapter four, where we are now, he starts talking about where do these wars and quarrels come from? And, and the basic answer to that is, is it comes from pride and, it, and they come from lust. All the arguments, all the fights, all the wars that we're seeing, it, at the root of it is always the same thing. It's either about pride or lust or both. And so on Tuesday, I talked about how destructive and dangerous quarreling is. Now, quarreling is not like a war. It's usually a verbal um, argument between two people who normally get along fine. That's the way the, de the uh, dictionary defines it. Um, I talked about how dangerous that quarreling is. Today, I want to show you what he says about turning the corner here. When things are not going well, when you're not sure what might happen next, here are some things that James recommends to turn the corner or like uh, like Bob Seeger used to say, turn the page. And maybe some of you, I know I've, I, gosh, I've seen so much and heard so much and even, and, and for me, I get to the point where I'm like ready to turn the page. Um, I don't know if that's a good song. I don't know, I don't remember, I do remember all the words to it, but I, I don't know if it's a good song or not, but turn the page. It's time to turn the page. All right, so here's a couple of things. One, make a decision. I'm ready to see some things change. In James chapter four, verse eight, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And that, that, this is all about a decision. It's a decision that we have to make, a decision that I have to make. If I'm wanting to draw near to God, I have to decide that's what I'm, I'm going to do. It is a decision that is based on faith, my knowledge of God, the things that I know about him. And he said, but remember, he also said, faith without works is dead. So we can say that we have faith, but if we never make a decision to change or do something more, do something different, do something that the word has told us to do, to exercise, to prove our faith, then that faith without works is dead. What will I do? What will you do in the coming days or the coming weeks to draw near to God? Um, I don't know if you have a plan. Maybe this would be a good time to make a plan. You can't keep doing what you've always done and then expect different results. There has to come a time where we we make a decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a plan and I'm going to draw near to God. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That word contrite means repentant. It's, it's like an admission of guilt. And you say, well, I didn't, want, I didn't want to feel guilty this morning. Look, we're all guilty. And, and I don't know how people can act like they don't have any guilt or, or feel any guilt. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what he says. So you, you've heard me say it many times. The more that you see God for who he really is, the more that you'll see yourself for who you really are. And that's what Isaiah, when he, he said it best, when he said, woe is me for I am undone. He, he saw the Lord and he knew that his um, imperfections were great. And, and I think anytime we get close to God, we too understand it that I'm not doing as well as I thought. I'm not doing, it, doing as good as I think I could. So this is where things begin to change. This is what it means to draw near to God. He said, uh, one, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And see, that's talking about our actions, what, what we do and what we say. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's about changing some of our habits, lifestyle, things we find ourselves getting into, even some of the things that we talk about. But he says, uh, secondly, purify your hearts you double-minded. And, and I won't go into all the things about uh, being double-minded again, but uh, you know, God just wants us to focus on him. This is all about our attitude. When he says purify your hearts, he's talking about a good attitude um, and, and changing our way of thinking and re refocusing our thoughts and our way of thinking 
on him. In these troubled times, it's easy to get a bad attitude, you know, with all this mess that we have to see and, and listen to all the time. Um, it will make you jaded and unable to hear what God is trying to say. Um, there's just too much information coming in. Good morning, Bennard. Um, good to see you, brother. That's Pastor Bennard from Opapo Church in Kenya. Um, find time with God in His Word. Make make a point. Set aside that time. That 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 is how you cleanse your hands and you purify your heart. Don't don't take in all the wickedness. Of, of politics and protest and all the other stuff that's going on. And I know it's easy to get on Facebook, which is where we are right now, and just start, you know, shopping through there and uh, looking at different things. And there's so much negative and there's so much bad. And it's the same way with the news. If you watch the news, it can be so discouraging most of the time. God can't use you if you are like them. That's what he's saying. Only if you become more like him so uh that was that was the first one make a decision that i'm ready to see some things change number two stop expecting others to do for me what only god can do and maybe maybe we all get into this at times but that's what he was talking about when james said in in chapter four verse two you lust and do not have you murder and covet and cannot obtain you fight and war yet you have not because you ask not and what he's talking about is you're not asking god to meet your needs. You're not asking God for that next step, next level, next thing. You're trying to get it out of everyone else around you. And when they don't give it to you, that's when fights and wars and quarrels and all that stuff happens. Um, see, married folks need to know that, um, but they don't usually find out until after they get married. My spouse cannot meet all of my needs. That's not, that's not the way God designed this uh, marriage to work. Uh, it, it's not about somebody else always fulfilling my needs. Um, I have I have a great wife, but there are many things that I can only get from God, and and you know that's kind of where we all are, whether you're married or not. God wants to be your sole provider, uh, and we should be asking Him, not trying to fight and war and get the things that we want. God tells us, ask Him. Don't try to force others to meet your every need. So often pride then gets in the way. If others are not meeting my needs and my expectations, then pride starts getting in there. Proverbs 13, 10 says, the only effect of pride is fighting. When pride is in, inside of us, the only thing that can come of that is fights and wars and quarrels. He even calls uh, them in James chapter four here, adulterers and adulteresses um, because he said, you claim to be gods, but you work so hard to make friends with the things of this world. Now, that's pretty harsh language. Adulterer, adulteress, um, all because we say that we follow after God. We say that we are the bride of Christ, married to God, and yet we pursue the things of this world with so much um, eagerness and, and then pride and then selfishness and lust and all the other things get in there. All right, so number three. Um, uh, two was stop expecting others to do for me what only God can do. We, we could have went a lot further with that. But number three, so the answer is humility over pride and anger. Really, I mean, we need to focus on this whole idea of humility over pride and anger. You can always let your pride and anger get you into another quarrel or another conflict or you can handle the opposition of this world God's way big it's a it's a big question which way are you going to go what how are you going to do this are we going to handle the opposition with with pride and anger and and forcefulness just trying to get what we want fighting wars quarreling or are we going to do it God's way through humility James 4 6 says God can give more grace Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And you need to know that God can always give more grace. And, and I know things are tough. S some people are having it tougher than others. I think you've heard me say, and several others probably say, that uh, we're not all in the same boat uh, by no means. We're all in the same storm, but not all in the same boat. Uh, some people are, are uh, weathering this storm in a yacht, 
or, or a cruise ship, while others are weathering this storm in a in a ten foot flat bottom boat, a dinghy. You know, I mean, it's it's not we're not in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. And th- you can go one or two ways. You can either be prideful, but knowing that God says He resists the proud, or um, you can be humble knowing that God can always give you more grace to get through this storm and to get through these tough times. If we decide to let pride work to get us what we want and we we somehow feel like other people owe us um, something more or something better, that kind of impure heart only receives rejection and resistance from God. If, If we're angry with other people and we're expecting them, wanting them, trying to force them to do for us or give to us what we want, God's basically saying, that's the kind of attitude I'm going to resist and I'm going to reject. But the humble heart is where God will pour in more grace, the kind of grace that you need, grace that gets what we do not deserve, grace that gets you more of the things that you have not worked for, grace that gives you more of what you do not deserve, more favor, more more, uh, peace, more joy, like he started out talking about in James chapter 1. Um, this this kind of humility is simply about trusting God and over everything else, believing God, believing his word. First Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. How does he exalt you? Or, or how do you get put into a position where he will exalt you? How do you humble yourself? He said it in verse seven, by casting all your cares upon him giving him all of your worry, all of your stress, just just trusting him even when things don't look good. And he says you can do that because God genuinely cares for you. If you humble yourself by trusting God and his word, God will exalt you in due time. But if you want to get what you can through the wars and conflicts that come from pride, anger, and lust, then you will be rejected and resisted by God. That's what his word says. So here's the last part and thought for today. James chapter four, verse 10. He said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And uh, I don't know if I've ever seen more people burdened down than what there are right now. There are people who have a job that are worried that they're gonna lose their job. People who don't have a job, uh, who are worried that they never will have a job. I know there's even people out there that don't have a job and they're worried that someday they might be forced to go get a job. But I, that I don't really know that much about. But there's people that are stuck at home and burdened down with fear. They have you know, the fear of, of the disease, the fear of the unknown, the fear of the future. They got all these fears and they're dealing with it like on a compounded level every day. God says, I'll lift you up. God says he will lift you up if you will humble yourself before him. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And I've told you before, hum- humility doesn't mean that you don't like yourself. Humility just means that you're trusting God more than anything else. And the world has so many believers deceived about this that now believers are you know, starting to get you know, I'm militant, you know, and I, they owe me, this is not right, I want more, I want more, I want more. Now, I'm, you, I mean, we, we do have our part to do and we do need to vote. And there may come a day, there may be a time now or a situation now where you have to pick up a sign and say, this ain't right. You know, we need to change some stuff. That's your American right. But your God-given right all takes place when one, you make a change. You decide I'm ready to make a change with God. And then you humble yourself and you trust him to do the things that only God can do. Other people can't do this stuff for you. If they do, they're going to want something in return, right? Trust God. God, there are some things that only God can do. You you will, you'll have to receive all of this by faith. Everything, everything that comes out of his word, everything that God is wanting to pour into your life, you need to, you need, you will receive it only by faith, trusting God in his word and, and keep doing those things that God has said do and not what this world is trying to force out of you. Keep doing what God said do. Here, last verse, I'm done. Uh, Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. That's the whole point. Don't be deceived by the world. Don't be sucked into what they're trying to give you. Um, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. To him that sows to the flesh, 
shall of the flesh reap corruption, but him that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And then he says, let us not grow weary. Let's not get tired in doing good and doing well. For in due season, you will reap if you don't faint, if you don't lose heart. So don't be deceived by the things of this world. God is saying, you know enough about God already to do what he wants you to do. Keep doing it. Keep pushing, keep pressing, keep trusting him. Live a life of humility. Don't don't try to force uh, what's right on everybody else around you right now. You can't force that on them. Keep trusting God. God will open up a door. I'm, I'm believing that. I'm believing that for your life and my life and for every believer in this country. God will open up a door if we will set our mind to humble ourselves before him, that he'll pour in more grace and he'll get us through the things that we are, are faced with at uh, this, this given time. Well, um, that's it. Uh, didn't mean to go that long, but I can't always keep from it. Uh, Brian, thank you. God bless you. Uh, it was good to see, see you on there. And um, for everybody else, um, hope you have a great day. Hope all things are well. Looking forward to seeing everyone on Sunday. Got another message on um, that the whole idea of finding our new normal or creating our new normal. Um, so until next time, God bless you. Love you. Bye-bye.